science fiction's fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and eons ago in internet years, I mentioned in passing the importance of a good beginning to your novel, because the publisher whose brain I have most often picked on this matter has reported that she knows within the first five pages whether she wants to sign an author or not. But it turns out that the five-page window is only for genres she likes. If the genre is high fantasy, for instance, I have with my own eyes seen the publisher get one paragraph and three impronounceable names in before tossing the book unceremoniously onto the slush pile. If your feelings on high fantasy are similar, there are lots of books I could recommend to you in order to try to change your mind. But a set of books I would decidedly not use to try to change your mind is Lloyd Alexander's award-winning Burdain series, the first two books of which are The Book of Three and The Black Cauldron. Near as I can figure, when Mr. Alexander won all of those awards for the Burdain series, it was either in an era where judges gave out awards for books they had not read, or said judges did not know the difference between good fantasy and bad fantasy. And there's lots of fantasy out there that is both bad and lovable. The Burdain Chronicles are not like that. They are riddled with cliché after cliché. Some of these clichés include the headstrong orphan who wants to be a warrior, like yesterday, his female counterpart who is secretly a princess, a magical something or other without which the plot cannot go, and a veritable waiting pool of characters that the author badly wants you to think is dead before resurrecting him or her when the fancy strikes. And the names. The stupid effing names, man. Remember back in the Phantom video where we talked about how French characters would speak in French, not French accents, and rather than painstakingly try to recreate accents, you can try to focus a little more exclusively on the story and the audience will still go with you? Other readers may disagree. I personally think that fantasy writers with their tendency to make up words and names are more prone to falling into this trap than some other writers. Because if you wanna, you can spell a word how it is said so that it can be more easily read out loud, or you can string together a bunch of consonants that don't mean much in the English language, and trust that your readers are smart and they will intuit that this collection of letters means this character or this place. But when you spell a word in a silly way and then oblige the reader to go back and look at your pronunciation key on purpose, it strikes me as needlessly pretentious. Such is not always the case. In Biting the Sun by Tanith Lee, for example, the glossary in the back of the book contains slang that human beings may have not thought of yet, or words for which there is not necessarily an expedient English equivalent. That is a good use of your back of the book reference for words. If, on the other hand, you were speaking of the cat's leer, spelled L-L-Y-R, then tell the reader in the back of the book that it is pronounced L-E-E-R. Remind me, please, why you couldn't spell it L-E-E-R instead of L-L-Y-R. No doubt punishing the world because your mama named you L-L-O-Y-D. I'm certain of it. On the other hand, the names of Pridane don't necessarily get less silly when we know what they mean, either. One of the more clever things that Mr. Alexander does between info dumps is when his heroes are seeking their lost oracle, one character sketches for another character a map in the dirt for the purpose of narrowing down where this oracle could have gone. Not bad. It helps orient the readers without making us feel like we have been force-fed information. But from this exchange, we learn that the heroes are holed up on a place called Mount Eagle, and the big bad lives in a place called Mount Dragon. Pro tip, when you are naming your places in your fantasy novel, anything you put Mount in front of is gonna sound filthy. The only ways to handle that are have fun with it, get mad at the reader for giggling at your kinky word choice, or use other words. And the thing is, funky fantasy names are a cosmetic issue that don't necessarily suggest bigger problems, but in this instance, there are plenty of bigger problems. There's a thing that this author does in particular that bugs the crap out of me, and that is in his handling of dialogue. Elsewhere in fiction, the handling of dialogue is pretty straightforward. Would you like to pull the express sometimes? asked Sir Top and Hat. Oh, yes, please, said Henry. That is a simple exchange, and depending on how verbose your characters are. The dialogue tags can vary a bit in complexity, but Mr. Alexander will interrupt his characters like two and three times a paragraph. I meant to come back sooner, Elanwe said, but Akron caught me talking to you. She started giving me a whipping. I bit her. Then she locked me in one of the chambers deep underground, Elanwe went on, pointing to the flagstones. There are hundreds of them under the spiral castle, and all kinds of galleries and little passages like a honeycomb. Akron didn't build them. This castle, they say, once belonged to a great king. She thinks she knows all the passageways, but she doesn't. She hasn't been in half of them. Can you imagine Akron going through a tunnel? She's older than she looks, you know. Ilanwe giggled. I know every one, and most of them connect with each other. Have I just gotten spoiled by writers who require their characters to talk in turn, rather than interrupt the characters to remind you who's talking? Could be. Let me know how much of a brat I am in the comments if you wanna. Also, something that made it into the movie from the book is how disrespected Ilanwe feels when she is referred to as the girl. Huh. What does a girl know about swords anyway? Girl? Girl? But the author himself refers to Ilanwe as the girl multiple times per chapter. 
buddy, if you do not respect your characters, who's gonna? For those of you who may have come to the movie first, or for those of you who reliably think the book is better and are going, aha, that explains so much about the movie, not sure it does, because both the books and the movie are ghastly messes, but for vastly different reasons. And because one of my naughty hopes is that I might one day be the source that school children consult before they go through the indignity of reading the text for their book reports, here is a short list of things that the books and the movie had in common. The villains of Bredain consistently seem to move into disintegrating castles that they did not build, the way bats might move into an attic in disrepair. Ilonwe is a lovable airhead who knows her way around the villain's castle better than Taran does. Gurgi is indeed an obnoxious sloth man-thing obsessed with food. The hags indeed threaten to eat our adventurers and call them cutesy names to the point of irritation. When they get to the home of the hags, they find lots of cauldrons. And midway through Black Cauldron the book, they start calling the Black Cauldron the Crocan for some reason? small gripe, but it's something that bothered me every time I saw it in the text. Our heroes try everything to avoid giving the hags their most valuable gadget. The fairy analog to whom Alexander refers as the fair folk are not actually disnified a hell of a lot. They really do bear a striking resemblance to the jingle jingle excessively cute Tinkerbell style fairy as opposed to the fairies of folklore who could mess you up. And if that wasn't irritating enough, Mr. Alexander stages this little bit of dialogue between the fair folk and his main characters. Ilanwe gasped with indignation. You do that, she cried, and you are a thief and a wretch. You gave me your word. Fair folk don't go back on their word. He took out his orange kerchief and mopped his brow again. Honor, he muttered. Yes, I was afraid you'd come to that. True, fair folk never break their word. There are human beings alive on planet Earth today who will not call them fairies. They are pixies because they are not fair. And I do get it. It is fiction. Folklore is public domain, and there's no laws against writing fairies or, say, vampires, however you feel like it. Just as you, as the author, are allowed to piss all over the long-standing tradition that is this folklore beastie, the reader is allowed to be irritated with you. Nevertheless, in fairness to the books, there are things that Mr. Alexander did right, or at least more interestingly than the movie. Here is a short list of things that Mr. Alexander got right. The first book in the Burdain series introduces Tarn with no less than three mentor figures with distinct personalities, as opposed to the movie, which replaces these mentors with a singularly boring one-man exposition machine. The Horned King, that black-hearted devil. The Horned King is a man of action who is out doing stuff on horseback for the entire book, as opposed to this shambling shut-in with his basement full of broken action figures. And what's the deal with these slipper socks? Would it have killed you, Mr. Animator, to give him some boots? When Taran is captured, he is taken to a place called the Spiral Castle that is governed by a lady named Akron, who is both beautiful and evil. And that doesn't sound particularly progressive today, to have a character that is allowed to be both beautiful and evil. The Disney movie is not progressive in this manner. The movie still uses outward appearance as shorthand for goodness or badness of characters. Alonwe is skinny and pretty enough, and therefore you know on sight that she is good as opposed to this young lady and the hags who... You know what? I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Hag number three is hotter than Alonwe by, like, a lot. Fight me, Jenny Craig. It is perhaps worth mentioning, though, that in the book, the hags are ugly for company, but beautiful when they think they are alone. They also spin thread when they are alone. So I don't know if these ladies are the fates, an allusion to some obscure folktale, a metaphor for persons who get as ugly as possible with other people so they won't get close, Book never says, but it was a nice bit of storytelling that was just kind of dropped and left alone. Nicely played. You got me with that, Mr. Alexander. Other instances in which the book and movie differ are the Creeper character mercifully does not exist. Ilanwe is the one who takes the magic sword from the crypt, not Taran. Fluter Flam is the best character ever. Right, so for this part of the video, I would like us to take a journey into Tangent Land and learn a trick or two about when to Disneyfy characters and when not to. You know how when you care an awful lot about world building, and characterization, and as the author, your love for that world and the characters in it shows up in your writing to the point that your readers know what the character likes to eat for breakfast, what songs were popular when they were growing up, what the story was behind their favorite piece of jewelry, things like that. For a whole decade of its existence, Disney has kind of shipped all that stuff away and replaced a whole lot of characters that could be terribly complex with adjective noun combos. I was first clued into this shortly after seeing the movie Maleficent, and I couldn't unsee it thereafter because it became extremely apparent that the actors were working within the boundaries of Angry King, Happy Princess, Dimwitted Fairy, and a Clueless Prince. But that's not actually why this movie fell flat for me. What made it fall flat for me was that the protagonist was doing the same thing that the other characters were doing, but her adjective-noun combo was Scorned Fairy. 
as a writer and an actor, you can get a lot of emotional and intellectual knowledge out of Scorned Fairy. That is why Juvenile Delinquent holds your attention less completely than Neurotic Pirate, and why you can have an insecure prince going head-to-head -head with an insecure prince that is behaving differently and still have an interesting story. This is not to say that adjective-noun combos don't have their place in your writing, because they totally do, and those places are the back of the book blurb, your elevator pitch, and assorted places where you need to write copy for yourself. I, for example, as a reader who might not be familiar with names like Bilbo or Smaug, if I'm looking at the back of the book blurb and I see things like Invisible Spy or Grumpy Dragon, the adjective-noun combo has just conjured images in my mind about what this story is about. Now, you may very well be asking, what a what did that whole excursion into Tangent Land have to do with the Black Cauldron? While the problem with Maleficent was that the actor chose an adjective-noun combo that outclassed everybody else's, in order to have Fluter Flam's adjective-noun combo match the other characters in intensity, the adapters of the story ended up with a bumbling bard, which befits the story about the headstrong orphan and the ditzy princess. Except in the book, the reason he's a bumbling bard is because bard is not his day job. Fluter's a king. He's good at it. He fights when he has to fight, he's diplomatic when he has to be diplomatic. He's so very good at being a king that his kingdom is strifeless, and he has nothing to do. So he goes off to be a bard for a while, because he always wanted to try it. All they had to do to make this character a thousand times more interesting is give him a different adjective-noun combo. Imagine the story they could have told if, instead of choosing a bumbling bard, they had chosen to incorporate a vagabond king. Yet, despite the many faults of the film, there are some glaring problems with the book that the black culture of the film actually fixes. The most notable of these, perhaps, is the Horned King. See, in the book, there are cauldron-born running around killing things, and there are these airborne spies called Gwythians, and corrupt warlords, and a whole bunch of little bad guys to whom the big bad guys presumably delegate. But the only one who talks is Akron, back at the Spiral Castle. See, the Horned King's not the boss. He's like number three in charge at the Perdane branch of evil forces. I'm guessing that the reason Disney condensed and made the three, three, three bad guys in one is because one bad guy is easier to animate, and Horned King is an adjective-noun combo. But in the book, the Horn King does not speak. He growls, he roars, he snarls. But at no point in the book do words come out of his face. Also, the Horn King is on horseback for the entire novel, which practically to the Disney crowd would mean that they would have to animate six limbs well as opposed to four limbs poorly every time the villain shows up. I'm guessing that because they could not feasibly see themselves doing that, they chose to make the Horn King a man of limited actions but powerful words, showed us the awful things he can do with those words, and cast John Hurt to play him, thereby making his voice his most memorable feature. While these changes are not quite enough to make the Horned King an exceptional villain, they make him a hell of a lot better than the books. If you take away any lessons from this video to your books, I would like it to be that there are three ways to build intimacy between your readers and your characters. Actions, dialogue, and monologue. If you don't think intimacy with your villain is important, your narrative will likely be weaker overall. Because if your villain cannot build intimacy with your readers, he can't get close enough to hurt them. Another thing the movie fixes is that when the cauldron demands a sacrifice, Gurgi's the one to step up. And Gurgi is by no means my favorite sidekick. But it works, because you have gotten to know this guy over the course of the movie, and you kind of can't help but feel sorry for him. In the book, it's this fool named Illadir, which I presume is like a no idea, only different. And Illadir has no redeeming qualities. That is not an exaggeration. This is not one of those cases where the bad parts are so bad that it taints the whole guy. He has a diarrhea stain on the underpants of humanity. He is egotistical. He is an unrelenting name-caller. The only part of him that actually made it into the movie is here, where the Horn King says, A baby boy, a scullery maid, and a broken-down minstrel. Which was Illidir's thing. He would not call the main characters by name. He sees Tarn as a rival and tries to kill him on page 151. By page 168, he realizes he was out of line bestows the only apology we will ever get from him, and bravely sacrifices himself to the cauldron by page 172. Oh, how we will mourn. Pro tip number two, if you want a character's death to mean something, you have to make the reader care about that character. That was my favorite part, though. Islamic plunged through the undergrowth. Taran strove to overtake her and seize the hanging bridle, but the roan sped onward toward the ravine. She did not check her speed, even at the brink. Islamic made a mighty leap, hung poised in the air for a moment, then plummeted to the rocks below. <laughs> I don't think I was supposed to laugh out loud when I read that the first time, but I totally did. Pro tip number three. See pro tip number two. And I could totally go on. There are six books in this F dash dash dashing series. I started the third, with slightly elevated hopes that things might be better, that the author might learn things by the time he got to the third book, but Ilonwi is still inane, Tarn is still insufferable. 
there's a kind of sort of suitor character for Elon Week who is about as ditzy as she is, but he's really charming. I like him a lot, but he's a rival to Tarrant, so the author really doesn't want me to like him for some reason, and I just, I, I can't. The upstart prince is jolly and clumsy and kind of a match for Elon Week in every way. I can't go with you on this journey, sir. In short, this is all a valuable lesson on what happens when bad stories happen to acceptable genres. I guess the nicest thing I could say about them is that there are a few stories that are so terrible that we can't learn stuff from them, even if all we learn is to not make the same mistakes in our stories. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. I post whenever I can. In the meantime, take it easy. Loves you. Bye. Like my channel, buy my crap. Do da, do da. There's no time to take a nap. Oh, do da day. Hey!